Hi guys, this is our fixed date now, isn't it? Monday, 3 p.m. It's time for ESPN Cricket for Open Mic, where we try and get you guys involved in conversations that uh, can be had about cricket in these times. And come on, let's keep the the conversation on cricket going, so that whenever cricket's back, none of us are rusty in thought or in mind or in words. And Brad Hodge is uh, anything but rusty these days. He's looking good. I saw his most recent Instagram post with him lifting some serious weight. For a second, I didn't see your face, Hodge. So I wasn't sure if it was you in that video or some stunt dummy or one of your younger boys that are doing that. But that's you. You're looking good, man. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, good, Ranok, actually. Um, look, I'm feeling sharp, you know, like yourself, trimmed up the beard, got the haircut. So, you know, even in lockdown, uh, you know, <laughs> slot in showbiz, we have to stay sharp for our fans. So I um, I was doing a little bit of fitness. There's not a lot else to do, as you know. Um, we're not mm. in as strict lockdown laws as you guys. I've been following India you know, very closely because, you know, I've got a lot of passion in India and, and cricket, of course. So I want to see how the IPL is going to happen, what's going to happen there. So I'm very much following the, the lockdown laws here. We're a little bit less uh, restricted. We can get out and about for a bit of exercise. And, you know, my wife has actually built me a little program where I can, uh, you know, buff the guns and lift a few weights and do a few things yeah. for the body. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Is that a subtle way of telling you you could be in better shape? Exactly. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. The uh, the middle middle age sort of uh, what do they call it? The the podge or whatever it is. So maybe it's, right. Yeah. yeah, call it what you want. Okay, yeah. we're going to discuss uh, the IPL because it's going to be back at some point, and uh, the conversation we're going to have with Brad Hodge, who of course will spend plenty of time in a number of IPL dugouts as player, as coach, and uh, can give us some uh, serious insight into conversations that can be had about how perhaps coaching in the IPL goes and maybe even how it's going to change in a world after COVID-19 whenever cricket and the IPL resumes. So we're going to have that chat. We're going to get your questions and thoughts uh, through to Brad as well. But before that, there's an all-new ESPN Cricket Info for you to enjoy during uh, these uh, tough times. Have a look. Missing cricket? Check out the fastest, sharper, all-new ESPNCricketInfo.com. Scores say a lot more. Yeah, of course, a lot more. You can catch uh, your favorite shows uh, on uh, ESPN Rick Info as well as read top articles in the alternative universe. We live ball by ball match commentary from classic matches of the S tier on Retro Live. We've done quite a few Retro Lives so far. It's been great fun. And uh, of course, check out the faster, sharper, all new ESPN Rick Info.com. Scores say a lot more. That's more than scores. That's what it means, Haji. Sean's pretty good with his Hindi, given I think he should have mastered it by now, living with Mushroom for the last. God knows how many years. Your Hindi is not bad. You've been in enough IPL franchises, including Punjab. Yeah, I have. Uh, I, I look, I know the, um, I know how to be nice, certainly about that, but I also know how to express myself pretty uh, aggressively as well when things don't go well in the dugout. So it's, uh, it's good. <laughs> look, um, we always try our best uh, as Australians at Tour Indy to try and grasp A, the culture, but also the language as well. So, it's not easy to learn. I mean, we're English. We only really have one language. Whether we should have bilingual or multilingual, like every other person around the globe, but you know we don't choose to. And um, I guess spending more than fifteen years in India, we should have a better knowledge yeah. of the Indian language. So, you know, fingers crossed. But when you get sacked, you don't need to. You can play on it. Worry about it too much. <laughs> then you can use one of those words to express your frustration, the ones that you picked up when you do get the sack. But uh, the new yes, Kendra Kinfo. You've right. seen it? You like it? I have. I look. It's the. It's probably the second uh, um, screen I open up in the morning when I wake up from from deep sleep. Uh, the first is the newspaper here in Melbourne to see what's happening with uh, COVID lockdown, and hopefully that will uh, ease. And the second one is ESPN Quick Info. And look. I love it. I think it's sharp. Um, I've always loved the site and, and the detailed analysis, what goes on there. The, the retro games are pretty cool. And and we've had a few little articles on some legends as well. Mayla J. Warner was in there not recently. And you know, I like yeah. reading stuff about that sort of, you know, legendary people involved in the game and how they go about, you know, different things. He was, he was talking more about coaching than his cricket, his playing days. But you know, I find that really interesting and cool. All right. So the conversation we're going to have today is going to be about coaching in the IPL and perhaps how challenging it is and what the challenges are in comparison to other leagues. Hodge's been 
played so much 2020 cricket. He's been part of uh, the management of 2020 franchises around the world. So I'm going to start with a question that's coming from Lee CD on our uh, on our uh, YouTube live, and this is a good way to start off. Now, Lee CD wants to know your experience of getting along with Ashwin. But that's a nice way to start by saying the challenge when it comes to coaching and getting along with a captain, where I do get the impression that coaches have a lot more to do and say in T20 franchise cricket than perhaps any other form of cricket. Audience. Yeah, your coach and captain relationship is is critical. And, um, yeah, especially in T20 cricket when he moves so fast and, you know, there's not a lot of time to actually, you know, be involved in the process of, um, you know, building from game to game and your captain really has to take a lot. I got along super well with Ashwin. I loved working with him. He was such a joy. He was a, And the best thing I loved about Ashwin was he was a student of the game. He was quite analytical and deep into analytics. He liked to talk tactics. He cared a lot about his uh, his group of men who he was, you know, mentoring around. Uh, so I thought that you know, I thought he really had an opportunity to raise the Kings eleven to, you know, not only a trophy but successful years. Um, that won't happen now because he's departed. But you know, I thought he was a good leader. I thought he was, um, you know, dedicated and passionate. And uh, he'd learn a few different ways. You know, he'd learn under Donny as well. So he had his way of 2020 cricket and, and, and a student in other areas as well. So, yeah, very good guy to work with. And I, I, I'm a, it's, it's unfortunate that it actually got cut short. Yeah, it, it, you get different types of characters, don't you? Different types of captain. You have Ashwin, who's the very analytical kind, who buys a lot into data and whatnot. You also had Suresh Raina at, uh, uh, at, at Gujarat Lions. And I get the impression he comes more from the MS school of thought, from just sort of, sort of going by instincts and whatnot. So, Sometimes it's be challenging to find different characters as captains that have completely uh, contrasting cultures. Yeah, they were different. I thought, um, yeah, Suresh in his first year was a lot more engaging than, you know, the second year. I think that he had his opportunity to captain. Well, I, I often tried to steer uh, Suresh away from uh, following exactly in MSD's, um, you know, way of captain and so forth. I sort of tried to say that you're your own man, you're your own captain, you have your own style, let's try and get that out. Don't take that away from what you haven't learned from such a great leader, but make sure you try and install your best characteristics on the rest of the group as well. And I thought, yeah, he was exceptional at that. He was a really good leader, um, played particularly well, and was very friendly and engaging with the Indian group and the overseas players uh, he was excellent. So I was surprised at how good a leader he actually was. Okay, this is from Karan Chanana on our Facebook Live. And keep the questions coming, guys. This is good fun. How about having bilingual coaches in the IPL, along with mental conditioning mentors, because of the pressure you guys go through being in the ground, at the grounds with huge capacities? The bilingual coaches is interesting. So many local players, uh, English not being their first language many times, so many foreign coaches at times. Uh, how do you find strike that balance, Haji? Well, uh, I think it's important, actually. I, I don't think it's critical. I think you actually have someone very close to you which understands, uh, you know, the, the, the national language. Uh, at Gujarat Lions, we had uh, Shitashu Kotak, who was um, Sarastra's head coach. And he was very good if I had an issue in trying to, um, you know, articulate to some young kid that wasn't fluent in English exactly how we wanted to go about it. So... I think that's critical as a coach to have someone close by you that can work that little system about articulating. Majib was a special one. Majib was a man from Afghanistan. He could only, by the time he came to us first, could only string a handful of English uh, words together. So we yeah. just kept it simple for him. We just told uh, the bowling coach and Satanshu just to tell him, just to bowl at the stumps, mate. Whatever you do, just bowl the thing at the stumps and do all your tricks. It's simple as it can get and stop the ball in the field. That was it. That was our messages, and he was good with that. Um, we didn't want to confuse any young kid with mixed messages. And, uh, yeah, it can be. But generally, the, the good thing is you, you find, a, find a method. Yeah. Uh, this is a good one from Karthik Puri on our YouTube Live. What's the ideal time before the IPL starts to set up a training camp, given the international players and their busy schedules? Uh, could it start earlier for domestic players so they get more time to train? This is always a challenge, isn't it, Audrey, when you come down and actually get the whole squad together before the start of the new IPL season? It's a real challenge. And, look, the hardest thing is that you have an idea about where players might actually 
have a role. And you often find that the earlier the training camp, you'll find that you can't often train that player particularly how you want. So you need your full squad there to work. The hardest thing about IPL and any T20 franchise cricket is knowing what the person next to you can actually do. So, And this is the, the trick. When you turn over a side so often, the player never knows what you can do when you walk in under pressure. So if you played for someone with such a long time, you know exactly what's going to happen. So in terms of the playing group, you'd love to have them there maybe two, maybe three weeks before the tournament starts. But the other thing is man management. You can certainly run out of gas in T and T20, especially the IPL. It's such a hard, long tournament. Um, you know, travel can come into it, sleep patterns. Uh, it's, it can be critical. But I think, you know, we've had days when, you know, international players haven't even showed up for the first game. So, you yeah. know, that's, that's part of the trick. That's part of the, uh, the atmosphere of IPL. Yeah. Uh, Sonu Kumar, is it true, this is Sonu on our Facebook Live, is it true that you once suggested that the IPL is brutal for coaches and is the pressure even bigger than coaching a national team? Audrey? Yeah, I, I don't think the pressure is greater. I, I certainly think that coaching in national side is is immense. But look, this grey hair is not there for no reason. That's, uh, <laughs> that's due to coaching and pretty much coaching in the Indian Premier League. Um, you would not believe the amount of pressure that you feel. You know that if you don't succeed or make the finals, you're pretty much out of a job or close to it anyway. And if you aren't that year, you're probably another 12 months away. So, And it is critical. And the hard thing about coaching is that it's never in your hands. The results actually are never in your hands. All you can do is plan and prepare your players the best you possibly can. What they do out on the field you're just hoping that they execute the best way that they've trained and use their skills in the best way they can. That's the hardest thing about coaching. All you're doing is preparing, playing, you're serving of the game, and the results are actually out of your hands. But And you can actually be, you know, if you think about Kings Eleven, we, uh, the, the year that I coached, we won the first six straight, I think, and then, you know, we lost two, but we were still only, you know, one game away from making the finals. You win one more game and, and you know, <laughs> Ashwin's a great captain and I'm a great coach. It's a fine, fine line. Is, is that the year that you moved from Mohali to Indore, which tends to happen yeah. to the Kings XI? Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a real critical uh, point in our season that, yeah, we just couldn't actually uh, – the ground didn't suit us at the time. The way we'd set up our yeah. game was built around Mohali, which was a big ground. We had three spinners in operation. Uh, it, was a, it was a recipe for us to work when we went to – Indoor, it just it just broke down. We actually couldn't claw our way back, which can certainly happen. All right, this is another one on Kings Eleven. Rabdeep Mehta watching on our Facebook Live. How was your experience coaching in the Kings Eleven? Being a native Punjabi, that's Rabdeep. Uh, it's so frustrating that they finish in the bottom half most times. What's their problem? Is it management? Is it players? Is it work ethic? Or is it everything? This is a, this is a passionate Punjab fan asking his former head coach why did they not succeed in the IPL? There's a number of reasons, and look, I probably need to keep those remarks a bit closer to me. Uh, sure. I think that I, I think that it's a really difficult question to answer. What I will say is that my time coaching the Kings Eleven, I can't say it was an enjoyable one. I must admit, um, it was it was it could be difficult at times. Like I said, any any time you're coaching a, a high profile team. Um, is difficult and we and they are striving for success that's the problem and so hungry for success that results become so important so important to make sure you win the game so you make the finals but uh why are they there i think that um you know if i was critical i'd say that you know they have turned over so many people through that organization since day one um, you know, maybe they didn't. They let they let go of a couple of really good core group of players who were there early on in the in the years. Where if you look at CSK, they kept them. You know, Dhoni, yeah. Rayna, Jadeja, whoever it was. Um, Kings got rid of um, Yuvraj, uh, Dinesh Kartik, all those guys, which now are senior members or were senior members. You know, they were here, there, and everywhere, and and, and probably lost their core group. And that's hard to call back. It takes time. So, you know, you can't – everyone wants success that year. 
Bottom line is only one out of the eight sides can win. Uh, and it's not that easy to win. So, um, you know, we sort of had a plan where I sort of said to him, what's success? Success in any sort of big high-level sport is in a 10-year period, a decade, you'd hopefully win three. But my point yep. to the Kings Eleven uh, hierarchy was it doesn't have to be this year. It doesn't matter whether it's in two years' time that you win three on a bounce. Um, yep. You've got to work out what you see as success. And I'm not sure they yeah. quite understood that. Yeah, I think that's a good point you make. You look at CSK, for instance, and they've won, what, uh, four titles now, three titles now? I got that right? They've won, let's, let's do the math. They've done 2010 with Kolkata. So they've got 10, 11, uh, and 18 when they came back. So they won three titles in yeah. 10 years. So that's CSK. And you look at them essentially as a successful franchise. But... It's the match that you're talking about. If you keep that core group of players together, you're happy with three out of ten. Uh, God of Sundara Raman. Oh, sorry, are you moving around, Oji? I've just got to get my charger because I'm just about to run out. This is my <laughs> life. <laughs> this is why life is no good. Uh, anyway, we're oh, good to you, go, brother. You, you um, and your first world problems, Oji. You and your first correct. world country problems. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Sorry right. for the viewers. Um, I apologize. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Uh, so we've got some good questions to so keep them coming. Gaurav Sundar Raman. You remember Gaurav? You can't keep him away from an IPL discussion. Of course I know Gaurav. He's yeah. the master so, of all st st statistics for sure. So he, he's asking a question which I'm sure he already has about five answers to, but let's take it. It's on our Facebook Live. Uh, Gaurav says, with 12 seasons done, do you think that the IPL should now open up more positions for overseas players in the 11? Uh, and I'll take the second one later, but he also says, who do you believe, uh, whom do you believe uh, win games? Four strong overseas players or the strong domestic core? So that's a nice question. Let's take that. Yeah, I'll answer the first one in terms of, I believe that four international players is just the right amount. Maybe five, it could be, uh, but that's maximum. I I think the talent pool in India is really, really strong and they've got so many young superstars that come through. We've seen, you know, Shubman Gill emerge the IPL. There's been so many good stories. Rishabh Pant, uh, you know, they're just superstars of the game. But also some, you know, mystery spinners as well that you've never heard of. And, look, they probably wouldn't happen if it's taken up by overseas players. I'm really the for the way that you get young cricketers into the competition and, and give them an opportunity to be superstars. I like four. And from an overseas perspective, I've been on the playing side as well. And yeah. if you're not if you're not in that four, Gigi strive hard to get in there as well. Um, and that, that was, that's what makes it really cool. You know, basically when you show up where you sit, you know that if you're in the eighth or ninth position, you're just going to carry the drinks for most time. You want to make a good good impression. Uh, I like the fact that four is a nice mix. Um, you know that the makeup of an Indian side is going to be of majority of Indian spinners as well. So there's no need to go into the outside market for that. Maybe there's a couple. Um, Tahir is one, you know, the Afghanistan uh, spinners. But apart from that, you've probably got that covered. Superstar sure. players, um, batters, you don't need any more batters. So I think the mix is quite well. Um, the second question was, remind um, me again. Better. Whether the overseas players win more titles or the core domestic players, who's more important to winning games? I'd say the local domestic Indian players. Cause my theory is is that the overseas players cancel themselves out, basically, because they're all so good. They're all of equal talent that you cannot distinguish who's better between Josh Butler, Stokes. Uh, Stokes is wrong. Let's go... Um, Sorry, let's go Finch and Warner. You can't right. distinguish who's better. They're both guns. They both open the batting. You can go, I know Gurev will get the IPL stats out and say Warner's better. Let's forget that. On a Playing at the MCG, they're both guns, right? Um, yeah. So they sort of cancel themselves out. There's only probably a handful of pe uh, handful of um, overseas players which – Go above that, I'd say Andre sure. Russell's one. Yeah, you know, definitely. He, he's just irreplaceable. He's the best in the world. I'd say Rashid Khan is probably another. Um, but the rest sort of cancel themselves out. You can 
you know, if you have an all-rounder in your side, you'll generally have – the opposition will have a pretty good all-rounder as well. You'll have an opening batter for, you know, Rajasthan will have Joss Butler, um, Mumbai will have Quentin de Kock. They're both gun players. Whether they're hot or not, yeah. doesn't matter. Um, so my theory is that the Indian players pretty much win those one or two critical games which get you into the finals. That's why that core group of players – Yes, yeah. so important, so important. All right, this is from Balachandra Hegre, and he first posted on our YouTube live, and then he popped over and posted it on our Facebook live. Don't worry, I'm watching both of these, Balachandra, so uh, you can post it where you want, but it's a very good question, so I'm going to take it. Um, as a coach, uh, are you not in the same page as the captain with respect to team selection? How does that work out? He's curious. So does the coach have as much of a say in selection as the captain, Oji? Uh 2020 is certainly different to other aspects. Yeah, as a coach, you want to give your um, captain who he wants on the field, so to speak, because he's got to go into battle and he want, he needs to know and have great confidence that those 11 players that he takes on the field will get the job done. As a coach, you might only probably disagree a couple of times throughout the season. You'll generally be on the same page. And as a coach, you might then explain to him well, this is the reason why. And if you can go through, you know, a strategy or a process, this is why in this particular game you might, you know, use this particular person. But generally you'll be on the same page. And I'll be honest with you, you only ever start talking a lot about team selection when you're going south. <laughs> you know, that's the hardest thing about IPL. When you start losing and you know you've got nine gun international players and you can only pick four, and you've lost a couple, the, the reasoning yeah. is, and the noise from outside, that is owners and, and people go, well, how come? Why don't we play him? So all of a sudden you get some traction, then you start guessing, and then you go to the captain, oh, what do you think about him? So it only ever happens when you actually lose. When you're winning, you'll make one or two changes just for the tactical stuff. But all in all, your 10 players will remain pretty close to the same. All right. This is a similar sort of question from Bhanu Prakash Reddy on our YouTube. Again, about how much was a coach involved in the team selection? Who takes the final call? I guess the other thing is, where is the power center in IPL franchise or in, yeah. in a 2020 franchise? Does it does it vary from franchise to franchise? Or in certain cases, is the coach more important? Because I could see that in the Sunrisers when they didn't have David Warner around and Bhubaneswar Kumar was like a makeshift captain and only played when, when the team needed him to. On the other hand, I don't think you can ever second guess MS Dhoni at Chennai. So it seems like it's a it's a it's something which isn't consistent. Is, is that right? Yes, this is this is a really interesting debate actually about how much power the captain has uh, across all T twenty leagues. And I think that um, MS Dhoni's created this and he's created it because he was so great. And everyone around the world wants to emulate the great MSD and control things and do things you know, on the field the way he does. But there's a problem. Not everyone's like MSD. Not everyone's yeah. a skillful and they're not every, they're, no one's going to be a wisdom top 100 players like he's going to be. So, um, yeah, what, look, what I've found is that the, the, the captain and the playing group have wrestled a hell of a lot of decision-making process away from management over the last few years. Now, I can't speak for everyone, but these are just little little things that I've seen around leagues where captains are making the big calls. Um, and the problem comes is that they're actually not the ones that lose their job at the end of it. So um, the players keep playing, the captain keeps going, and the coach gets yeah. booted out. So, look, it's a real conundrum. You have to work with them. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think you'll start to find that you know, like a little bit of power will shift back um, towards management to make sure that, you know, they're the ones that make the decision-making pro or not the, decision, the final decision um, because ultimately it rests on their shoulders. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can foresee it becoming a bit like football where the, it's the manager's job, he's on the line. And because 2020 is so quick, you almost need someone from the outside to, to take control rather than have a captain who's, you know, in the, mix, in the midst of it, would that work? If there is a format where it can work, even though it's so contrary to the way cricket is run, it's a captain-oriented sport, but do you think that could happen in, in time to come? 
There is no sport like it. There is absolutely yeah. no sport like cricket where, you know, the, the weight of the world is on the coach's shoulders, yet all the decisions effectively are made by the captain. Um, yeah. It's such a unique in, uh, sport and it's very hard to determine. So that, and that's why we collectively try and make really good decisions together. So mm-hmm. ultimately we're all praying or all hoping that we've done the homework right, we're all on the same page, and the results will take care of themselves because we're all we're all ultimately in it together. So, yeah, we know yeah. it doesn't always go to plan, but um, you yeah, know that's the bottom line. So, uh, yeah, that's cricket is such a unique one. It's it's really hard. The, the manager, I'm sure, who gets paid five million pounds in the English Premier League, yeah, you know, when the boss comes knocking on the door, he's got to go. Yeah. yeah, ultimately, that's my call. Cricket's a little yeah. bit different because. You know, you've got to explain that, look, as a management group, you know, we did give the captain that choice of person because we felt that in a collective decision, it was the right decision. So, yeah, I mean, the thing is, the cricket, everyone's got an opinion. Why did that play that there? Why, why did you play that shot? What was he doing? Yeah. You know, like, it's such a tough game, cricket. It's so hard. And yeah. T20 is so difficult, so difficult. All right. This is from Sandeep Revy on our Facebook Live. Uh, what's your take on the new mid-season transfer concept? Now, there was a lot of talk on transfers mid-season. There was, it was all speculated at the time that the IPL Governing Council was considering it. And it involved either limiting it to just the uncapped Indian players that can be transferred. There was talk of whether it should just be to the overseas players. But what do you think a transfer window can do? And, if, and what sort of transfer window can affect uh, the IPL positively? Yeah, I'm not sure about it, to be honest. I... I... Yeah, most teams have around 20 to 25 players on their list. So I'm not sure why you need a transfer window if you haven't got that uh, decision right in the first place. So for me, you would only ever transfer unless it's a financial gain. And uh, usually someone that wants to have one of your players is probably down the bottom of the list. So, you know, why would you effectively want to give an opportunity to someone else mid-table to improve their position. I, I, I don't understand that at all. All right, this is from Dharmik Sankarva watching on our uh, Facebook Live. I hope I've got that pronunciation right, Dharmik. Uh, is the role of the wicketkeeper limited in 2020 cricket? I mean, will you choose a keeper just because of his keeping skills? Uh, and he's an eight or nine batter. And this debate is, of course, very popular at the moment with KL Rahul becoming what looks like the number one keeper in uh, white ball cricket for India now, uh, Hoji. And, you, uh, you would have seen his uh, his growth as an IPL player in a pop and job and becoming a number one keeper. So what's, yep. your, what's your take on that? Well, first of all, if you mention K.R. Rahul, I will say that his skills are exceptional. Um, and you can't doubt his quality of glove work. He's he's effective. He he does he works hard. He, he, he does everything he does clean. And, um, and his batting is, oof, what a skillful player. Um, yeah, he should be in any side. And if you can do both roles, um, you know, that's that's a really interesting one. You've been in a luxurious position to have Mahindra Singh Dhoni, one of the greatest finishers ever to play the game. You've got one of the most exciting in Rishabh Pant just waiting there, just, you know, wanting to nail his spot. And K.O. Rahul, who uh, I, watched the, I watched him dispatch... Jasper Boomer, first ball of an IPL game over extra cover for six. Mm. So this is a guy that bowled 150 kilometers an hour. Now, anyone that skillfully could hit a bowler over extra cover, first ball into the top tier of indoor, that's a skillful player. Um, and his numbers are good. Now, back to the question do you have someone at number eight who's just an outstanding player, uh, wicket keeper? If you've got a gun spinner or a couple of gun spinners, then probably the answer is yes because wickets are pretty critical. And your number eight batsman hardly touches the hardly touches the stick. So if your mm. number if you if your players from one to seven haven't done the job, you're gonna lose anyway. So you know you can, if if you've got a good enough side to have a really good wicket keeper in there, then I suggest you try and find it. All right. Sandeep Sandy on our Facebook Live. Which team is closer to your heart, Hoji? Kings Eleven, Rajasthan Royals or Adelaide Strikers? 
He's left out the other 15 teams that I played for <laughs> so, <laughs> Sunday. Um, you could put in there Barisal Burners. You could put anything in there. Um, look, uh, for me, the most enjoyable time that I had was uh, working with Royal Dravid at uh, Rajasthan Royals. It was something for me which is really special only because – a, Rahul's a legend and I love the way that he coached and I love the way that he uh, worked with players and, and, and it was such a good young group. But he convinced me to do something which I wasn't entirely comfortable in doing, which was a great lesson. And that was moving from top order to become a finisher. And yeah, initially I uh, yeah, I was sort of questioning what it was all about. But you know, I really took that on board and I loved what Rahul had to, to say and how he sold it. As a, as a coach and as a player. And, of course, to me, it had a great impact. It, uh, it gave me a different role um, and, and I took it on and it became quite refreshing. And uh, I really love the Royals family. I love what they represented at that time. Um, is there any better bloke in cricket than Raul Driver anyway? So whenever yep. you get to spend, uh, you know, 10 weeks with the wall, you're pretty happy, aren't you? Um, but, you know, they're all special. Kings eleven um, for a reason that coaching, you know, it was, a, it was a tough, difficult challenge. Adelaide strike as well. What a place to play cricket. Is there a mm. – I guess, I'll tell you, Adelaide Oval is the best cricket stadium in the world, bar none, hands down. All right. Well done. And this is a man from Victoria saying that. So – I hope Correct. you mean it from the bottom it's of your tough. heart. Yeah, yeah, I'll probably get I'll, pro I'll get bashed later on when I walk outside. <laughs> I don't sure I'm not sure how many uh, Victorians are watching us. The questions are mostly coming from India, from the IPL fans. So you should be safe. Uh, all right, let's just take uh, the final few questions as we continue this conversation on coaching uh, in the IPL with uh, Brad Hodge. This is from uh, Mohammed Wafi Abrar on our YouTube, um, and uh, he he wants you to answer honestly on what is the thing that attracts you uh, to what's the speciality in the IPL that attracts you, Brad Hodge? What's it about the IPL that makes it different from the others? Well, let's be honest. Let's start with the big one and let's put the, the dollar signs out there as well. It's, it, is, it is a very attractive league when you get paid handsomely to put your skills on show. Um, sure. and, and, and let's be honest, uh, it is a show and it is a huge show. And and as sportsmen, we want to be in the limelight. So IPL is that limelight. So, um, you know, that's why. There's everything about it which is great. You go up there and, and as I said, what, are, what do you love about it? It's pressure, especially as an overseas player because, as I said, you're on a bench or you're playing and you look next to you and there's anyone at any game could take your spot. So you have to be at the top of your peak every time you go towards IPL and you start thinking about as a player at least four to five months out from the start of the tournament. That's how important it is and that's how critical it is to um, to get the process right. So, you know, straight away you can have two bad games in the IPL. Look at Richard Levy. He was a superstar. And yeah. three, games, three games at Mumbai Indians and he's gone. See you later, Richard. Never again. <laughs> And we've seen a few of those. That's what can happen. There are so yeah. many good players out there in the world. You've got a couple of opportunities to make it, and that's why I love the knife edge that IPL is. You know, this is a curious one. I'm taking it only because it's come from a man named Prayas Ray Burman on our YouTube live. Now, if I remember, Prayas Ray Burman was a spinner who played for RCB. I don't know if it's the same person asking, and it's, he was a leg spinner, and he played that one game against the Sunrisers, a teenage uh, leg spinner. And yeah, uh, it, it, obviously, Besto and Warner, I think, took a liking to him. But uh, what's more important for a leg spinner, turning the ball or being accurate? But I want you to tell me, perhaps, if you're the same player who actually played for the RCB. That would be fun if we get an IPL player talking to us. Haji? I remember watching this game. Is this when yeah. they put on about 160? Uh, Besto got one, 10, yeah. one yeah, they 10 got and... Both, and, and what a disaster. I mean, <laughs> that is one of the moments in sports where you go... Oh my God! How did I? How did I find myself bowling against Johnny Bairstow and David Warner when they're on fire? Yeah. What's the most important for a leg spinner? Well, turning the ball or being accurate. Uh, I would say, right at present, 
it's accuracy, but it's more length. Length in T20 it appears to be more critical than accuracy, actually. So um, if your length's right, you can't actually step and hit. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Rashid Khan's the first one that comes to mind where, you know, his length's actually impeccable. He's not a big turner of the ball. No one can pick him, but still, uh, you know, the lengths. We had um, a mystery spinner, um, uh, Koshak. Koshak. Yeah, Shivel Koshak. Koshak wasn't at Gujarat, wasn't a big spinner of the ball. What he did yeah. is he landed the ball impeccably on a length to hit the top of the stumps. So, A, it didn't allow any room, but it didn't allow any any swings of the arc either. So, uh, it's a really tough one because as a spinner, Prayas, you have to sort of learn your craft for the four of uh, three dimensions of the game. Four-day cricket, yeah, you have to spin it. You don't spin it, you're not going to wick it. One-day cricket, more, more accurate stump to the stump. And T20, accurate length with subtle variations. They seem to be what works. All right, this is a good one from Anurag Sharma on our YouTube live. How do you handle dominating personalities in the dressing room? And Prayas has just confirmed that he is the same uh, spinner. So tough game for you, Prayas, but hang in there as a uh, young guy and there's going to be a lot more cricket coming up. So good luck. I hope that helped from Brad Hodge. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, let's take this from Anurag Sharma on our YouTube live. Um, how do you handle dominating personalities in a dressing room? I think the IPL throws up more dominating personalities than most leagues. Obviously. Yeah. You don't dominate. You you let peacocks be peacocks. It's as simple as that. They they have beautiful feathers for a reason, and you want those feathers to come out. You, the last thing you want to do is try and uh, stop it. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> you get 20 cricketers in there. They have all got an ego. They've all got uh, an attitude. We all want to be the best. There's no doubt about it. Um, how do you manage it? It's just subtle little variations, getting the group dynamics together, um, and you pump those players up as best you possibly can to shine. Um, you know, there's not only, you know, 10 or 12 peacocks on your side, but there's another 10 or 12 on the other side. <laughs> it's whoever wants to shine the brightest on that night. All right. And as I wind up, I'm going to take one question that came through from our uh, promotions to this uh, this show. and. Is that if you want to feature your question in this, then just make sure you send it through uh, when we put out the post for the next open mic from Prasanna Venkatesh. Uh, what lesson would you share with today's youngsters? Focus more on technique uh, and uh, and master first-class cricket or train yourself as a big hitter and focus on the IPL? Really tough question. I think if you're, I think if you're on the larger side, big, strong hitter, you focus on that. But for me... Cricket is still all about you need a good defensive mechanism. So, you know, in four-day cricket, if someone bowls a good ball, you've got to be able to keep it out. It's the same in 2020. If someone bowls a good ball, at some stage you're going to have to keep it out. So most times, if you train yourself to be a good four-day cricketer, you can generally adapt to T20 cricket. There's a, there's only a couple who have gone the other way. David Warner started the other way and become a great test cricketer. But... Most good players are good players. You'll find a way. The hardest thing about T20 is actually not whether you can hit it or not. It's the decision-making process. What are you going to do when you're faced with getting 30 runs of 15 balls? How are you going to go about it? And what are you going to do to get, to get that job done? So they're the decisions that you have to make. If you're a big hitter, by all means, play to your strengths. Look at Pollard. Pollard can't even play a cover drive. Yeah, you can miss hit a ball for six of one caddy, which goes into the second tier. That's that's the talent. Um, yeah. Not many people can do that. Uh, but what I will say is that if you can train or be go to your coaches and say, listen, I want to be a great defensive player in four-day cricket, but, hey, I want to be a great T20 player. So is there a way which we can train or manage my coaching time so we can cross both those paths? So it actually is a really good coaching tool, to, and the coaches love it as well. They're, you know, we just do that, and you're getting blocked all day. Sooner or later, you want to see some guy smash it out of the park. So, you know, as yeah. a coach, you go, look, make sure to get the red balls out and then get the white balls out and smack them as far as you can. There's, I can tell you one thing. There is no blocking in my house. So my mm -hmm. daughter plays under nine cricket. There's no blocking. Her future is... IPL, female IPL. 
<laughs> I'm female test cricket, so yeah. no blocking in my house. Yeah, and on that note, I'm going to take this one from Babishan Sharma on our Facebook Live, where he says, Brad, I must say I have been a great fan of yours, but honestly, you never let me watch you long enough on many occasions. Uh, <laughs> how's that for a backhanded sledge, eh? Or a <laughs> hey, that's fine. It's, uh, you know what? We all wanted to bat longer or we all wanted to do longer than we wanted to. But unfortunately, there's other people out there that are just better than you. So, yes, uh, thank you for that kind words. I'll, I don't <laughs> think I can come out of retirement at 46 and make a wrong right either. I think the best has passed me. So... Unfortunately, you've got me on that one, Mr. Sharma. Well done. Yeah, yeah. I hope at least you've seen Brad Hodge for long enough on this open mic. That's why we kept him on 40 minutes or so. And it's a selfless T20 innings, isn't it? When you when you do your bit and you don't hog balls, then after that, and you then, then move on and let the other guys do. That's how it works. And Brad Hodge is a T20 legend. Hodge, I hope you've enjoyed this. This has been fun. It's been good, Radak. Yeah. Um... I, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's been fun talking about subjects which I'm passionate about and, and, and the viewers are passionate and they love their cricket, so it's been great. All right, and thank you all to, uh, uh, for, for watching and for sending in your questions. And I'm sorry if I couldn't take any more of those, but we'll keep having these discussions on ESPN Rick and for Open Mic. We'll uh, look forward to your company for that then. And, of course, until then, stay safe, take care, and uh, check out ESPNRickInfo.com for... Uh, all the very latest stuff from the world of cricket and the all-new ESPN Rick and Poe, which is, of course, scores a lot more.